Uh, at this time, is the state ready to present its opening arguments? All right, you may proceed, Ms. Coakley. Good morning, everyone. Over the course of this week, you're going to hear a lot and get to know a lot about the life of Ronan Farida. He is 16 years old. But this case starts, and really the focus of what his life was like is how his life was in or end of December 2021 and January of 2022 when he was just 14 years old. This morning, you're going to learn that on January 28th, 2022, he ran away from home. He lived in Jupiter, Florida at that time with his parents, the defendant, Tim Ferreter, and his mom, Tracy Ferreter. From Vietnam, and he had lived with the Ferreter since that time. He was the second of their four children. During this trial, a younger sister and in January of 2022, he was a student at Independence Middle School and 14 years old. You're going to hear on the 28th, he didn't, he ran away from home. He was reported missing to the Jupiter Police Department, and that's where this case starts. You're going to hear from Jupiter Police Department officers who are going to tell you that they um, took the report of a missing child and that he didn't come home on the next day, on the 29th, and he also still was not located on the 30th. They went back to the Ferreter residence to find out if there was new information. Had he come home? Was there any leads? Um, the day he left was a Friday, still wasn't there on Saturday, and on Sunday, Detective Sharp from the Jupiter Police Department went into the Ferreter home with Tracy Ferreter. You're going to hear it's at that point that for the very first time he learned what the situation was like at home with his parents. He's going to tell you that he was shown the house and the first thing that stood out to him was that the child who they were looking for didn't have a place to sleep in the main house. There wasn't a bedroom for him. There weren't his items of clothes. There weren't his toys inside of the house. Instead, there was a structure, a small room box-like structure that was constructed in the garage that didn't have any windows. It had a box spring and a mattress, a bucket in the corner, and a desk. You're gonna hear that um, at that point, the child still wasn't found, and so Ann, Detective Sharp left and continued the investigation. And the next day, which is Monday, he is um, made secure, made safe by the Jupiter Police Department, and that's when the criminal investigation really starts, after they had the opportunity to speak to him. You're going to hear that as part of the investigation during that initial walkthrough of the room, Detective Sharp realized that that small cell-like room had a ring camera in the corner to observe the occupant of the room. And so as part of his investigation, he served a search warrant to the Ring Corporation to see if they had maintained any videos. And you're going to get the opportunity to see and hear that evidence that was returned from the Ring Corporation. Because that Ring camera captured moment after here over and over and over again, that door locking and unlocking. Because the evidence is going to show that that room He was locked inside from the outside over and over again. You're also going to see that he had, did not have the ability to control things like the lights in that room, that the only way that those lights could be controlled was outside the room. And so you're going to see him sitting in the dark in a windowless room for hours at a time. And we're not just talking from 10 p.m. till 7 o'clock in the morning overnight. You're going to see that even during the day, there are times in which his parents 
the defendant and his wife would turn off that light and leave their 14-year-old son locked in a room in the dark, alone, isolated. You're also gonna get to observe and hear the anger and the derision, the physical altercations that this defendant has with his child on the ring camera, physical intimidation and the threats of violence. You're also going hours overnight. He did not have access or the opportunity to go to the bathroom. And the only option for him was to pee in the bucket. And then you're gonna see the next morning when that occurred, that this defendant would tell him, clean out the bucket, make sure the neighbors don't see you doing that. Because this treatment, his life, was kind of a secret thing. And you're gonna hear that it's not the state's case and it's not the evidence in this case that he was kept in there 24 hours a day. He went to school. There were times where he was outside of the room with his family. There was times where he was shoveling shells for his father for hours at a time. But for long periods of time, for mass majority of this child's life in that period in Jupiter, Florida, he's in that room, isolated, alone, without autonomy, without privacy, without stimulation, sometimes with only a single book to read over and over again. As part of the evidence in this case, you're going to hear that the defendants are charged with that four week period, that four to six week period, because they moved, the family moved to Jupiter, Florida in December of 2021, mid-December, kind of a week or two before Christmas. And this all happens at the end of January. So we're talking about six weeks when they are in Palm Beach County, Florida. And so that's the charge time period. That's the criminal conduct that we're talking about. But the state expects that you're gonna hear evidence about Ronan's life before the family moved to Florida, when they lived in Arizona. We expect that you're gonna hear testimony about a very similar, nearly identical room that the family constructed for him in Arizona, in which he had been residing in since he was 11 years old. You're gonna hear that that room had no access to a bathroom, no control of the lights, no freedom of movement, that he was recorded and that he was locked in from the outside with only a bucket to go to the bathroom. The charges in this case are aggravated child abuse, child neglect, and false imprisonment. And at the end of this trial, Judge Coates is going to read you instructions about what the law is for child abuse in the state of Florida. And you're gonna hear that there are, there's child abuse and there's aggravated child abuse. Aggravated child abuse occurs when a defendant engages in malicious punishment of a child, willful torture, or the willful caging of a child. And those are in the alternative, meaning it could be any of them. And child abuse in the state of Florida means the intentional act that causes physical, mental, physical or mental harm or conduct that is likely to cause physical or mental harm. So that doesn't mean that there actually has to be harm, it's just that it's likely to cause harm, that they engage in an act that is likely to harm a child. And to help you understand what the harm is here and how this conduct is criminal, the state is gonna call a Dr. Wade Meyer. Dr. Meyer is a child psychiatrist. He's aff affiliated with Brown University, and he's going to tell you the impact that this kind of treatment has on a child, that it's humiliating, isolating, cruel, and malicious. He's going to tell you that it will cause harm to any child, but it will certainly cause harm. That harm could be exacerbated if that child already has a behavioral issue or has trauma. And you're gonna hear about some of that in this case. Mistakes and that he did things that, um, that his parents punished him for. But you're going to hear 
that in no circumstance is this a protective punishment for any child. And in particular, for a child who may have issues with trauma or a behavioral issue, that this is the worst possible thing that a parent could do. It is the exact opposite of any recommended treatment, of any therapeutic purpose, or anything that would lead to productive, um, a re productive response from a child. Instead, Dr. Myers would tell you that it would increase the likelihood of behavioral issues. Because when you isolate a child like this, when you humiliate them, when you basically put them in solitary confinement for large portions of the day, that has a negative mental impact. At the end of this trial, Judge Coates will instruct you on the law, but I want to be very clear on a couple of things. The state here does not have to prove that every moment there are no moments when he was let out of the room. That's not the state's case, and that's not what Dr. Myers is going to say is necessary to cause harm. We also don't have to prove, and you're not going to hear, that there's any kind of legal defense or special standard for a child that has behavioral issues. That if overall. The law, you're going to hear from Dr. Coates, it's Dr. Coates, excuse me, Judge Coates. The law you're going to hear from Judge Coates is not going to be that there's any kind of affirmative defense or that there's any different standard just because a child has behavioral issues. We're here today because of the actions of Tim Ferreter towards his son. They were ongoing, they were intentional, and they were criminal. And so at the end of this trial, after you have heard all of the evidence, all of the testimony in the law from Judge Coates, we're going to ask you for the only verdict that is supported by the evidence and the law. And that's a verdict of guilty as charged. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ms. Coakley. It's defense ready. Okay, opening statement from the prosecution in the state of Florida. We'll get a break and watch the defense. Stay with us. Florida father accused of locking his son in a box in the garage with a bed, a bucket, and a camera. He was locked in a room for hours at a time. Police say this abuse went unnoticed for years. There are ring videos that the state provided of the child lying. He faces up to 40 years. I'm not sure they're going to be able to justify it. What's going on in this house? The Boy in a Box Trial. Live coverage today on Court TV dollars a month. I'm Julia Janae in West Palm Beach, Florida for the Boy in a Box trial. And this is Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Welcome back. Opening statements underway in the trial for the Florida man accused of locking his adopted son in a box-like structure for hours at a time in the family garage. Tim Ferrer, charged with false imprisonment of a child and child neglect. His wife, Tracy, also faces the same charges. They're being tried separately. This is his trial. He's going first. We're going to go back in and pick up the opening statements from the defense. We want to um, uh, point out something. You might be hearing um, gaps in this, like where it's silent. It's because the children's names, the, fa the family names are being used. They're underage, so we can't show them. Uh, and, and the way that we do that is we, we blank the audio. It's annoying, but it's only going to be during these opening statements where it'll be frequent. Stick with us. Here's the defense. The parents' responsibility to make tough choices. Tough choices to protect their child. Tough choices to protect their other children and tough choices to protect the community. And that is what Tim Ferriger did in this He was faced with an impossible situation. And he made tough choices. From himself, from the other children in his home, and from the community. You only have to make one determination in this case. 
and that is whether or not Tim Ferrater had the criminal intent necessary. That's it. Did he or did he not have the criminal intent? And that will be your guiding question throughout this case. This case is not about whether or not Tim Ferrater made the right choice because I will be the first to tell you, the defense will be the first to tell you that he did not. But what it is about is the difficulty of parenting, right? Because bad parenting does not make somebody a criminal. Bad parenting does not mean that a person should be charged with a crime. It makes them human. It makes them a parent who is trying to figure out when faced with a child, as, you, as you'll hear throughout the trial, who has consistent and escalating behavioral issues, how to handle them. You will learn more throughout the trial, but I want to try in these next uh, few minutes to share with you what that relationship looked like. In 2009, Tim Ferrater and his wife Tracy took the very long flight to Vietnam to a Tracy had spent some time in the Honduras, and so they were really motivated to adopt. And the first and they wanted her uh, to have a sibling that was culturally close to her. While just a few years, they go from this young couple to a little family. They have three little babies. Um, and this is really the first iteration of that. Tim and Tracy love these children. Objection, Your Honor. Oh, they did everything that they could when they were young. Karate, softball. Um, science posters and galaxies. So he had a periodic table of elements and, and stuff about galaxies in his room because those were his interests. But what we don't know is how our stories will be written. You don't know where our children are going to end up. And as parents, all you can do is try to raise children who make good choices, who are gonna be productive members of the community, and hope that that works. And it Later in this week, you will hear from a seasoned psychologist, Dr. Sheila Rappa. Dr. Rappa is well respected as a forensic psychologist. She's routinely hired by the state attorney's office. She is routinely court appointed uh, to conduct psychological evaluations um, in this county to give um, opinions about psychiatric or, or psychological um, expertise. And her specific experience is working with children uniquely qualified to speak with you about the records that she's reviewed and the patterns of behavior that she noticed. A neurological examination. And what it shows, and as Dr. Rappa will explain to you, is that neuropsychological evaluation showed elevated levels of a lack of inhibition and clinically elevated levels of a lack of emotional regulation. And as Dr. Rappa will explain to you, these elevated levels are associated with uh, early life brain development, usually when someone's a baby, preverbal, or even in utero. And that makes sense because Dr. Rappa reviewed records, early childhood records of Ty. And what they show is that he had malnourishment, he um, was not well taken care of when he was dropped off at the orphanage and while he was there. 
We can't know his exact medical history um, because his biological mother just left him at the orphanage. But the records that Dr. Rappa has revealed brain development. And it's why the ferreters continued to see patterns of behavior that would not stop. I want to take you through some of those patterns. Um, overruled for purposes of opening. His parents regularly received emails of him fighting at school, punching other kids using profanity. Announcement. He has his sister stand up and humiliates her in front of the entire class saying that she's a horrible person. And it was so disturbing to the teacher who was present, who you'll hear from throughout this trial, that she had to report it. that the challenging work would engage him. It was sort of a math and science type school, so they thought that that would help him um, stop. It did not. He stood up in class at that school and asked if the Holocaust was a good thing. He was accused of telling a student that they should get aborted. He got up in class and said that immigrants are more likely to be drug dealers. He brought a screwdriver to class and was waving it in someone's face. He stole another student's laptop, hacked into it, and looked up women getting run over by trains. Sustained. And he pretended to be a tutor to a friend of his. Sustained. And that happened while he was in Council America. approach. Hmm, okay. <laughs> Defense attorney uh, called to the office there. Let's uh, bring in uh, during this sidebar Megan Whiteside. She's in Washington, D.C., and uh, she's watching along with this trial attorney, also host of the uh, podcast Mom, Life, and Law. Megan, what do you, your thoughts here as we watched the state and, and now most of the defense? Well, it's very interesting, and we can tell there's a bench conference going on right now based on motions in limine. So there's obviously been uh, a lot of information exchanged in discovery and some fights about what the jury should hear. But what I really see that's interesting between the prosecution's opening and the defense's opening is focus on the defense as the prosecution has to focus on the defendant's conduct and the defense is really trying to blame the victim here blame this child who was allegedly imprisoned and allegedly abused for what his parents did and that's a risky strategy for the defense um and what this case is going to come down to i think really is going to be a lot of common sense right the defense is trying to say oh bad parenting isn't criminal but the government really did a nice job of likening this to solitary confinement which i think on a common sense level people are going to understand is cruel yeah, saying that what they did was is not a protected punishment in the state of Florida. Um, we'll get a break in here, get you back for the rest of the defense opening, and then we'll watch as the state of Florida presents its case in chief against Tim Farrader. Stay with us. Tonight, Rosie O'Donnell joins us live following her jailhouse interview with Lyle Menendez. New evidence and a new alleged victim of Eric and Lyle's father shines a spotlight on this case once again over 30 years later. Why did you kill your parents? Because we were afraid. Find out what she learned and what could be next for the Menendez brothers. Closing arguments with Vinnie Politan tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Let's go 
go back to Florida and pick up the uh, opening statement from the defense. We're going to pick it up right after the sidebar breaks up. Hey, Ms. Hey, and then stole her father's credit card and utilized it. It's just uh, overruled as to that. Thank you, Judge. This is just a handful of the consistent. Tell you, as the state said in their opening, that he can't, he knows that things are wrong and he continues to do them. He knows that there are consequences and he continues to do them. And all this time, Tim and Tracy are racking their brains trying to figure out. These kids go to school, they have their own activities, they have a toddler at one point. They have to be able to get through the day-to-day -day of just being an adult and having a family, be able to send their child to school safely, knowing that other children will remain safe. So they try to get him into activities to kind of take out his energy. And when they see that's not working, they do counseling. They give him the medications that he's prescribed. They try to help him sleep at night because he keeps wandering the house. They cut sugar from his diet on the recommendation of a pediatrician that maybe that'll help his behavior um, and, and that'll make him less impulsive. This family is going from place to place to place, from appointment to appointment, trying to figure out how to get this child actual help, how to get a diagnosis, and how to get medication that will change his behavior. And as we discussed in voir dire together, what they found was a revolving door of doctors and therapists, and no one was able to offer them the help that they needed. You will see. of that it's not always going to look pretty just as it doesn't look pretty in real life when a parent gets mad at their kid particularly a child um, and you must remember when you see the video, vi videos particularly a child who for years and years and years is continuing to engage in these behaviors who will not stop in 2019 while living in Havasu Arizona Ronan had been hurting other kids at school. He had been engaging in dangerous behaviors. He's walking around at night. And they did not know if an infant And that is when they made the decision while he lived inside their home in Arizona. This is not in the garage. This is in a house to put a lock on his door. And that was not for the purpose of keeping him locked inside at all times. It was not for the purpose of even punishment. It was for the purpose of monitoring him when they couldn't. Because unfortunately, they're in a situation where they cannot leave this child unattended. There has to be somebody constantly watching him. And they cannot do that as two working adults. of him around the house and he will tell you himself that the door was not always locked but they did use it when it couldn't be supervised in the Arizona house in the garage for Ty it had a bed it had a desk it had Legos you'll hear from witnesses who actually saw that room books that he had um, in the room in Arizona. So right before Christmas of 2021, that's when we get to sort of the time relevant in this case. The Ferreters moved back to Jupiter, where they lived many, many years ago when the kids were young. And they 
books and toys, you'll see videos of him in his room. He's reading, he's talking to his friends, he has Legos there. He is not allowed to have technology in his room alone um, because that's not something that they felt was safe, but he had other types of activities. Um, he did have like a school Chromebook that was provided by the school. You'll see him FaceTiming with a friend of his. Um, he had posters up on the wall that he, you know, when he got angry, ripped down himself. That's why the walls will look bare. Both the room in Arizona and the one in Florida had one very big design flaw, and that is that it did not include a bathroom. And bucket for the bathroom if he needed to use the bathroom. During the day, he was permitted to move about the house freely and he could utilize the bathroom in the house itself. And I'm gonna be very honest with you, you're gonna see him use the bathroom in that bucket a handful of times over this four to five week period. Um, he's a kid, so he's not waking up and using the bathroom all the time, like probably all of us are. Um, and so he is, he uses it a few times and it's not gonna look pretty. But what you have to remember throughout this case right, is that this was not some big secret life like the state is presenting. These people went to doctors, they went to therapists, the schools in Arizona. In Florida, they were only here for about four weeks right before Christmas, and then school started. So this is not some sort of that Tom had a real issue. Everybody knew that Tim and Tracy were trying and trying and trying to get a diagnosis so that he could get appropriate help, and it never happened. As you review the evidence in this case, you have to remember that the issue at hand is not whether or not Tim Farrader is a great dad. It is not whether Tim Farrader did what you would have done, and it's not even if Tim Farrader did the right thing, because our own expert, Dr. Rappel, will say that he did not, and that those actions could have been damaging to the child. That does not make his actions a crime. The singular question in this case is whether or not there was criminal intent. Because what Tim did not do is have his child arrested, not one time. What he did not do is undergo a failed adoption proceeding where you essentially return a child back to the Department of Children and Families. Sustained. He paid. Sustained. I'm, okay. No need to approach, I sustain the objection. He paid for private. That he was engaged in. But he had to make tough choices to protect his son, to protect the other kids in his home, and to protect the community from a child who was already showing, you know, a screwdriver in class, hitting other kids. He had to do that. And he, though he didn't handle it correctly, his intentions were not criminal. Dr. Rappa will testify, based on her extensive experience and review of the records, that what she sees in this case is not malicious. That what she sees in this case is actually very common for parents with children who have such extensive behavioral issues that are hard to sort of diagnose and pinpoint.